This video is the second part of this series. Check out in the description section the link for the first video, in which we have seen how to install High Persistence Optimizer to detect the JPN Hibernate performance issues in this Shopizer open source project. What's nice about it is that this is fully programmatic. So once you once uh, you are going to fix all of them, you could have something like an assert true events is empty. So I don't have any issue. And when a new event occurs because someone changes something and creates this issue, your test will fail and you are going to be notified. Actually, you're, you're not going to be able to build the project, which is better than shipping something that might have performance issues. And in this repository, as I told you, you have it, it's everything, it's in GitHub. And I'm going to run it, but basically you can run it uh, at any time. So now let's just go and check out the next commit. So what I did in the, the next commit, I wanted to get rid of all the configuration issues to fix them. So I can do that here. Basically, I had to do it in two places because one place is the place where I had the configurations that are being loaded when the actual Spring Boot application runs and the other place is for this integration test because they have different configurations. So I had to do it uh, in uh, two places. This is the one. So this is for the application. This is what, when this Spring application starts, it would load these uh, properties. And now we uh, basically change and add other properties here. Now, let's just take one by one here. Normally, you don't need to specify the fetch size for MySQL or for Postgres. You don't need to specify this one. Why? Because it uses the default strategy in Postgres and MySQL is to fetch the entire resource set, even if you don't traverse it. And that's great because normally you are traversing it. The only time we are not traversing it is if you're using get result stream, which is rarely used. And in that case, yes, you could set it but only for that particular queries. But because here we're using the H2 dialect and it uses some default fetch size of 100, we can increase that one to 500. This one was set to false for backward compatibility, but we don't need it. We can command this out and use, because we're running from scratch, and use the new setting, which is this one is enabled by default. What this ID new generator mappings does, without this one, Hibernate, would use some very old uh, identifier generators that are based on the high low optimizer. But if uh, you don't explicitly disable that, you are going to get the pooled and the pool optimizers, which are much better because they're interoperable with other people using the sequences. Okay, so that was the fetching and the global identifiers. The next one, this one is not strictly related to performance, we're setting the time zone. We're setting the time zone to UTC. Normally, I like to do that. I like to have uh, UTC in the database at the driver level. If you can, that would be great to have it at JVM level and only use the locale in the UI, at the client side, in the browser or in the UI. Why? Because you can translate, then you can do the translation only for the UI and have everything else use only UTC. If all of them use the same standard uh, time zone, it's much easier to reason about time zones. Otherwise, if every layer of your application uses a different time zone, doing all the time zone logic, shifting the zones, it's very hard, it's very complex, and it can lead to bugs that are hard to track. So this is not strictly related to performance, but it's more about avoiding using something that could generate uh, bugs. Now, this one, JDBC batch size, that one was indicated by High Persistence Optimizer. Normally, Hibernate doesn't do any JDBC batch updates for you by default, but you can activate it. That's great about Hibernate. You can take one application like this one, which is non-trivial. I just add a single configuration and it automatically switches from non-batching to batching instantly. Everything is going to take advantage of batching and that's great. Inserts, updates and deletes could be batched. And if you do that, it's important to use this order inserts and order updates. This one, you need this because normally if you have cascading, every time you switch from one entity to another one, you have to flush the previous batch. But if you do that, Hibernate is going during flushing to order the inserts and the updates so that the parents are inserted 
first, then the children, of course. So it does all this to maximize the automatic batching. Another thing which we have here, this one, this the provider disables the auto commit. Another great setting. This one I uh, created myself at the time when I was working for Red Hat. I was working on the Hibernate project. And why you need that? If you configured the connection pool like Hikari to disable the auto commit, every connection that is being uh, retrieved from the connection pool already has the auto commit disabled. We need to tell Hibernate that's the case because otherwise Hibernate will assume that the connection is in auto commit mode, which is the default in JDBC, and would have to basically acquire the connection eagerly. By the time you're entering a transactional block in Spring, it would just fetch that in order to disable the auto commit check. And that's bad because we are fetching a connection eagerly even when we don't need it right away. So why is that bad? It's because you're entering a transactional block and maybe you're calling on another microservice. And then you keep a connection open throughout the call for that microservice. So if that takes 250 milliseconds, you are holding on to a database connection for 250 milliseconds without even using it. So that's why this, this setting is actually extremely important. In close parameter padding, this one is nice for, uh, it's nice for Oracle for SQL Server or for other databases that use statement caching. And what it gives you, when you're using an enclose and you change, you vary the number of parameters, JDBC requires you to inject the right number of placeholder, the question marks there. And um, if you're using two, then it's going to be a different query than if you're using five parameters or six parameters. So every time you're varying the parameter uh, size, the number of uh, elements that go in the in close, you generate a different query and then you have a cache miss. This one in close parameter pairing tries to address that by reducing the possible number of in queries that could be generated. This one, if you're using join fetch with pagination, is going to throw an exception instead of just a warning. This one, normally JPQLs and Criteria API have to be translated to generate the SQL statement because only the SQL statement will have to go through JDBC to the database. That's what the database will have to eventually execute. But when you're writing JPQL or a Spring Data method name that derives the query, that one will create a Criteria API that will have to be parsed and is going to generate that query. The parsing, which happens in Hibernate, takes time. So Hibernate has a cache. So the queries that uh, are frequently used are going to be stored there in the cache. The cache size, the default size is 2000. So uh, you get a warning telling you that you might want to increase it. It's a good idea to increase it. Why? Because while you will require to use more RAM on the application side, you basically can avoid processing something that's intensive, like parsing that particular query over and over. And this one show SQL, we disable it because normally if you want to print the SQL queries, you are better off doing it using a logger, not with, this one prints to the console. In the same way, we're not using system out print line, we're using loggers. Normally you should do the same. This one basically avoids printing only in the console so that you can use the loggers. We now provide it several such uh, configurations. And I'm running this test again. We are going to see that uh, all this, uh, we had all this configuration property that we had before, now they are gone, they've been fixed. So we're not going to have 164 such events being found. Uh, it's 164 minus how many properties uh, events were previously uh, detected. We're not going to, to find those. This one is easy. Actually, fi um, fixing the configuration properties is the easiest. I usually start with this one. So it generates the events for the mappings. And we can see here for the configuration properties, it's zero. We, we got rid of them. But we have, as you can see here, we have for mappings. We have a lot of uh, by entity type. So we have many to many list, bidirectional, table generator. So we have also some issues that we are going to uh, go through next that are related to the mappings that we have uh, used for our entities. And we can also fix 
uh, we can also fix those. This video is the second part of this series. In the next video, we're going to see how we can fix the entity mapping issues, so stay tuned for more.